Welcome everyone to um, CIAT at TCTAP 2022. Um, and thank you for the organizer of TCTAP that um, invite us to be part of uh, this year's event again. Uh, it's our pleasure and honor uh, to be involved with uh, every year's uh, TCTAP. Um, this year CIAT has come up with uh, the theme of uh, the challenge of PCI in octogenarian nightmares uh, never seems old. Okay, so we're gonna talk about all the issues and problem involving around uh, not only uh, coronary, but also structural intervention in our elderly population. Okay. Um, we will have three cases uh, uh, that we'll present to you at the beginning, then we'll end up with one lecture. Okay. Uh, Co-moderator with me uh, today is Dr. Anik Kanoksin from our Chess, uh, Central Chess Hospital. So I decrap it, Dr. Anik. And we have um, two pa panelists, Dr. Naratip uh, Shunhamaniwat from Sirat Hospital and Dr. Tanirat Aramseri Wong from the Royal Army Hospital. Then our three case presenters are Dr. Asa Pishashaw from Sirat Hospital. Uh, Dr. Purit uh, Suranch Pakon from uh, uh, Central Chess uh, Institute, and then um, Dr. Chai Siwala Pakon from Chudalongkorn uh, Memorial Hospital. Then a um, lecture lecture today is Dr. Panipa Suwanasan uh, from Chiang Mai the University Hospital. So without any uh, without uh, any delay, let's start with our first case presentation. Uh, Dr. Anik, can you uh, introduce the case? Uh, for the first uh, case, uh, he will be Dr. Puri Suran Chipakon from the Thao Chess Institute of Thailand. He will, he will present in the, the title case is uh, an old man, an old iron man. Dr. Puri, please. Good, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you, CIAT and TCTAP for inviting me to uh, present my case today. I titled this case, An Old Iron Man. I don't have any potential conflict of interest. My case uh, uh, go back to five years ago. He was 86 years old male. The factor was hypertension, dyslipidemia. He, uh, he was a very active person. He can uh, bicycle one to two hours a day at home. Then he was presented with chest pain during bicycle limited at 10 minutes. After biking, exercise data was positive at three minutes. Echo was a, a little bit abnormal, like uh, my anterior wall hypokinesia. So he had long history of PCI, uh, four times PCI before, both at uh, LED and RCA. Uh, both PCI was before 2005. To summarize, LED have a one bare metal stain and two targeting stain at proximal part, the Texas one. And RCA have a two bare metal stain at distal part, so due to uh, exercise that is positive, I appoint him to do the angiogram. As you can see, the proximal LD had 90% diffuse stenosis. It uh, was ISR at proximal part, and the uh, distal CA have uh, 80 to 90% diffuse ISR at distal part. So uh, what will we do in this case? The burn vessel disease was already instantly associated with very diffuse. First, offer cabbage, two PCI, three optimized medication first, four imaging state tests, or five conservative treatment. So, due to stain failure at LED, so uh, our previous operator he uh, advised patient and his cousin to do cabbage because the stain already failure. Uh, uh, I took a syntax score at that time, so actually, syntax score was not bad. However, something was missing from syntax. There was no choice for PBS then or PCI or cabbage before. So uh, patient and cousins refused to do the vascularization. Patient still has an active lifestyle, bicycle for one hour a day. The lab was quite normal and I optimized medication as he had a chronic stabbing China with beta bulk, uh, CCB and uh, nitrate. Five years after that, a uh, patient has progressive chest pain from CCS class two to four. 
he cannot buy anymore. Just uh, uh, just can go to the bathroom and walk uh, around his house. He had a two times experience with a nasty with RCAG because he denied. Echo was done and he's very lucky one. The echo still normal. Good RV cystic function, no significant maula heart disease. After long discussion with patient and his cousin, now they agreed to do revascularization. So I performed CG again. Now his left main was focused to 50%, and the LED already sub total of pushing the few ISI at the proximal part. RCA was uh, more severe than before. So what will we do next again? So surely uh, I will preside for him. Uh, causing naked surgery for sure. Imaging cannot be done because patient was not coupled to, uh, to uh, sleep in the long cardiac MRI time. What to consider in ISR patient? Pile of previous stent, bare or dark eating stent? How many layers of the stent start? Which imaging should we use OCT or IWAT? Type of this or DCB. So uh, for ISR, I, I prefer OCT more than uh, IWAS if the patient have a good kidney function because I can uh, determine what kind of ISR patient have. So, and what to consider in O-patient? For sure, O8, in case leak of mortality during PCI, in case leak of bleeding after PCI. Lastly, how long can he allow us to do long procedure until he does not cooperate? So I PCI to the RCA first uh, using a 2O15 semi-comparison at the distal part, 10 to 14 ATM, and then I perform the OCT. So OCT from distal RCA to proximal show that he have uh, some parts of neoetymal hyperplasia and neoarthrosis. Some were homogeneous and some was uh, like a bilayer. So from Jack Mel, the revascularization for, for ISR parameters, then they prefer this. So I uh, use a 2.5-18 NC pre-delayed to get the adequate room to put other stand in. And then I put 2 strength 5 38 setting stand from the distal of the parameters then here, up above of So final angel cam with OCT, beside to ISR parameters, then at RCA with one starting stand using contrast 120 cc. So uh, from OCT, there are good stand uh, optimization, good stand expansion, and no proximal and distal core dissection. Next five months, I appoint him to do beside to LED again. Previously, he had a uh, one bimetal stand and two that you think stand. One that thinks stand is here, another one is here. So uh, all of LED have a uh, two stand start. In the interconnect of the two desks, there are three start here. So I continue PCI with a uh, color rail and filter XT and use a uh, two O20 semi compound balloon and show that it cannot dilate even though I going up to uh, 14 ATM. After I balloon, patient did not cooperate at all. Patient yelled out and want to get out of the overweight ta table, not sure acutely Liam or incorrect. So my old Iron Man becomes stubborn and angrier, angrier and Iron Man most of the time. So I tried to sedate him with Domicum 25 milligram and a fentanyl 50 microgram. Ocidol was stopped for a while to less than patient with uh, his uh, four limbs. So I continue PCI with a uh, 1% file load tabulator. Uh, first was 120,000, but it cannot go down to the desktop. So I increase to 180 to 190, but it's still stuck at the mid part of the, the stand. So I going up to 200,000 and it, it can go down. So after I think that I rotabate enough, I slow down the speed to 150 to give the larger lumen from rotabator. This is the OCT after lota. I plan to use OCT before lota, but it cannot go in. So I do OCT after rotabator. 
as you can see, most of it is a neo set, and uh, at the proximal part, it is a neo set with a calcify. Some thick fibers cap, cap is already cracked. However, it's still not an adequate dilatation. So I continue to uh, pre-dilate with a cutting balloon NSE to strength five up to 12 ATM at the proximal part of the LED and up to TO18 NC pedalate from 20 to 22 ATM from the distal the stand until the proximal and up to left main. This was the OCT after dilate with NSE and uh, NC at high pressure, more than 20 ATM. So the distal part is neointermal hyperplasia, some in homogeneous scan, and the mid part there are three stents that and the proximal part is a calcify and some dissection at the proximal part to the left main. So to summarize from OCT, uh, two start stent with neotorosid ISR at the distal part, two start stent neotorosid with calcium ISR with some dissection at the proximal part. So in the middle part, there are three stats. So these are new purpose ISR desk classification for more than two layers, actually it's for this, you should uh, go to cabbage if possible or DCB, no more others then. And if Neato sit with calcify, I already do scoring balloon and the rotabator already. And non calcify you can use a DCB or this. For the distal part, I think it's a, like a type 2B with a five because of already two layer of stand and it's just Neato sit. So I plan to use the DCB at the distal part and put others then from the hidden part to the proximal. So I, I don't want more than T stand start because in between is already T start. If I put others then in, it will be four start. And I need to use the desk because it's already uh, into the left main. So first is a starting stand at the proximal part. And then I caught with a T part five, 22 same balloon at this up to 16 ATM. And use DCB at the distal part so uh, this was final intro cam. Uh, I, I cannot uh, do the final kissing balloon or change to other pot balloon because now the patient is very in coverlet. He tried to give a, a get up out of the table and one of our nurse staff need to put his shoulder down to the bed. So I uh, try to in a rush to stop the procedure. So this is summary of the case. Total contrast was 110 cc. Conclusion. In elderly patients, there are more leaks in performing PCI, such as mortality, heart failure, and breathing. And most of the time, I found a problem with the patient already uh, have the stand inside of his coriatory, and we need to collect it. And old patients might not cover it well during PCI. If possible, we should consult anesthesia before, which is quite difficult to consult. In instantly cirrhosis, intercorrhea matching is mandatory to guide PCI technique, which I prefer OCT more than I was. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Puit. Um, this first case clearly demonstrates several problems related to the uh, elderly, including you know, multiple PCIs, uh, which result in multiple layers of stent, instant restenosis, um, a poor acceptance for surgery, and also in, co in cooperation during PCI, which sometimes make you wonder if surgery may be a better option because they can put him to sleep. So um, um, let, let me ask our panelists, Dr. Tanderat, do you have any comment on this first case? Congratulations, Dr. Purit, with your successful Ion Man case. You have demonstrated uh, all the history of the series of stents. So we heard about multi links, uh, start from bare metal stent to tinic that I never heard before, and uh, Texas, and so many stents that uh, we have put in this case. And we, we can see that uh, in the past, we using quite a, a small uh, diameter of the stent, this case using 2.5. Actually, the vessel site is larger than that, that and it also have the bimetal stain. So you have three stain in the middle, uh, mid LED, 
uh, three layer of stents in mid LED, which is uh, impossible to put more one more stent. And uh, this time, after you successful doing the RCA and LED, do you think it's gonna be come back to lysinosis? And next time, what would you plan to do it with this case? And uh, how long the anti pellet regimen that you going to keep in this case? This is my question. Okay, uh, that's a very good question. So uh, first, uh, I hopefully that he will didn't get the uh, nostalgia or chest pain again. He was now uh, 91 years old. So uh, next time on, he start then and he didn't want to do cabbage. So I asked the cousin to, to pay for DCB now. <laughs> After DCB if something happened. And the second for the DABT, the patient is a, he is a very uh, lucky that he don't have a knee high beating leg. So that uh, I definitely give him uh, aspirin and pyrrhic for lifelong. Yeah. Lifelong until breathing? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. Dr. Panipa, you have any comment regarding the use of imaging in this particular situation? Yes, so um, I think it's because it's an ISR um, uh, region, so OCT would undoubtedly, I mean, is is it the most suitable of uh, imaging to see what happened in the ISR? I think for the, I was, it would be also good in this patient because if we also want to reduce the, the contrast volume, maybe if we don't use the OCT, the number of contrast would go down. Maybe Dr. Kuri can do less than 70. But however, I just have a question regarding the OCT finding in the, in the LAD because you have a rotavator um, to a blade for many times. But when we take a look at the OCT pullback, um, um, I don't think that, that the, the calcium in, in, inside that from, from the OCT pullback after you actually already also do the rota and also uh, for the balloon, it's not really burdened as we see in the native vessel. So do you think that the cause of the rota cannot go uh, um, I mean, you have repeat for many times. Is that any cause uh, more than the calcium or you think uh, any problem that make you difficulty to advance the road up? Yes, uh, it's a very good point. I think uh, when I uh, did a uh, uh, rotor beta inside the stand, sometimes the rotor was uh, like uh, they, uh, attached to the PVS stand and they're stuck in the stand a little bit. So it's difficult to make the bias to the, the middle of the lumen. So that's why I have the problem to, to put the, the lotar beta in. Yes, as you notice that there, there's not much calcium in the inside of the, the ISR this time. Yeah. See, we still have a few more minutes left for the Q&A. Dr. Um, Adain, do you uh, wanna comment? Dr. Fleet, uh, congratulations for your successful case. And I have a question about uh, the imaging in, in, in this case compared between IOS and OCT. Because of, uh, as we know that the ISR is, uh, most of them is a uh, neo-intimal hyperplasia. So, so is that mean that <laughs> we need to know that your stent is, uh, the previous stent is uh, under expand or uh, under size compared to the vessel size? But the OCT cannot did not show any uh, uh, border of the vessel size, so we we want uh, quite uh, uh, wonder about the size of the, the the region because of how why for the ISR RCA that why you use the two point seven five because of the previous stand is two point five right, but, yes, but the yes. OCT didn't show that the how big of the vessel in this case, so mm -hmm. maybe. I think in this particular case, uh, maybe I was is a better. Mm. Thank you, Dr. Nick, for your comment. Okay, so at least you um, 
kind of kept him um, in good shape for what 20 almost 20 years now right with with this multiple pci and multiple stent and with yes. him probably getting off the bed and all that so um thank you dr purit for the excellent demonstration of um, like the classic example of PCI in octogenarian. Um, our second case will be presented by Dr. Chaisei Walapakon from uh, Jualongkorn Hospital. His title is Misfortune Never Comes Alone. Uh, Dr. Chaisei, please. Uh, it is my pleasure to share my case with TCTAP. My case title is Misfortune Never Comes Alone. This is my disclosure slide. Um, this patient was an 86-year-old Thai lady. She presented with dyspnea and chest pain on exertion. She had hypertension, diabetes, and dyslipidemia. She also had a history of um, PCI at left main to LED two years ago at Arthur Hospital. And her medication are shown on the slide. The resting ECG was normal. About the blood test, uh, it showed my anemia, and from the chest X-ray, there was a borderline cardiomegaly with my uh, pulmonary congestion. The echo showed mildly impaired LV cystic function. The LVEF was about forty-nine uh, percent. This is the left core angiogram. Um, there was no instant restenosis. However, there was. A, uh, an 80% stenosis at the proximal circumflex with a large chunk of calcium. And um, these are the cranial view. There was some collateral flow to the RCA. And for the RCA, uh, there was a severe stenosis at the proximal part with heavy calcification and the lesion was quite long from proximal to mid RCA. Uh, here is the syntax score and STS score. After the treatment option was discussed with uh, the patient and her relative, we decided to perform PCI. So RCA was uh, our first target uh, because of the uh, heavy calcification. We used lotablator for plaque modification. And after five runs with uh, 1.5 millimeter burst size, this is the result. Uh, the flow was quite good uh, without major dissection. Uh, then trio NC balloon was inflated around 18 to 20 atm from mid to proximal RCA, and the balloon was well expanded. Then the lesion was fixed with two uh, stents from mid to proximal RCA. And this is the final angiogram of the RCA. Good flow without any dissection. And there was no complication. The patient was discharged on the next day and stage PCI at the circumflex was arranged in the next three weeks. The lesion at the proximal circumflex was very tight with a heavy calcification. And on the left side, you can see that the IVAS could not be passed. So a uh, rotational artritomy was set up. The procedure, sorry. The procedure was done for eight runs uh, with 1.5 millimeter burst size at the speed of 180,000 RPM. And this is the result after a uh, lot of later. Uh, TB3 flow with some dissection at the proximal circumflex. Then I was, was done. Um, you can see that the vessel size was about 3 to 3.5 and the calcium plaque was broken. Uh, then 3 NC balloon was inflated at around 18 atm from proximal to mid circumflex. And the first stent was deployed at the mid uh, left circumflex. However, um, the second stent was stuck and, and could not be crossed. 
So uh, we, we pull back the, the stent and uh, we dilated the lesion again with trio NC balloon at higher pressure. However, the, the stent still couldn't be crossed. And first of all, why I was pulling back the stent, I felt some resistance. And finally, only balloon came back, but the stent was stuck at the proximal circumflex. And I also lost the Y, which made it more difficult to fix this problem. Now, this is the situation uh, we had total stain and guide wire loss. So what would you do in this situation? Would you crush it? Which I think it might be a possible option, but should not be the primary option. Or would you leave it or just let it go? But I'm quite sure that no one, no one would accept this. So I think stain retrieval must be the treatment of choice in this case. But how? This is the actual gam after uh, we, we uh, detect that we lost the stent, the Timmy tree, uh, the Timmy flow was Timmy tree. And the stent was at just the osteum of the circumflex. Here is, here is this, the stent. We recrossed uh, two coronary Ys with an intention to pass the Y through the stent strut. And then we try to retrieve the stent with a small balloon, one or balloon. We cross the balloon, pass through the stent, we inflated the balloon and pull back. The balloon can pull back. The balloon could be pulled back into the catheter, but the stent could not. The stent is still at the same place. The eye was show that the stent was at uh, the proximal circumference and it was just outside the coronary Y. Here is the stent. Then we try with twisted Y technique, but we still fail and we lost the Y again. Next, we uh, recross the Y again to the circumflex and try to retrieve the stent again and again and again with the balloon, but we still fail even with 2.5 balloon, we still could not retrieve the stand. Finally, um, we did the twisted Y technique, but this time we used three coronary Ys. We twisted all the Ys together about 30 rounds and then gently pull back. You can see that uh, when I pull back the Y, the catheter moved forward. And then the stent will slowly come back. But um, the stent is still outside the catheter. We try to bring the stent back into the catheter, but again, we lost it at the iliofemoral artery. I will show you uh, with the uh, big picture. Here is the stent. Um, why we were pulling back to Y, the stent slip out from the Y. So what next? Uh, would you follow the, the stent? Uh, actually, the first thing that we must do is not follow the stent, but we should go, we should, uh, go back to the quarry and check is there any complication after we retrieve the stent. The actual cam showed that uh, there was a huge dissection at the circumflex, the LED, and also the left main. However, the flow was still TB3, the water size was stable, and the patient had no chest pain. We quickly recrossed the Y, then pre-dilated um, the LED to the left main, and then we pre-dilated the circumflex, and we stent the proximal LED. And for the distal left main bifurcation, we, do, uh, we, we, we did the mini crush technique. We deploy uh, the stand at the proximal circumflex with uh, a minimal protrusion to the left main, and then we crush the stand with the balloon at the left main. 
the last ten was deployed from the left pane to the proximal LED. And then we recross the Y to the circumflex. We open the strut. We did the kissing balloon inflation and final port. This is the final angiogram. Um, there was no resolution dissection with T metry flow. The IWAS was done. Um, on your left is uh, the IWAS from the LED and on your right from the circumflex. You can see that the uh, board, board stands um, were well expand and opposed to the vessel wall uh, without any residual dissection. So have we finished? Not yet. Do you still remember the stand that we left behind? Uh, we looked for the stand, but it was gone. It was gone. Um, can you find where it was? Okay, I, I will show you. Here's a stand at the property of artery, quite far from, from the beginning. And again, how to retrieve this stand? This time we were going to be a cowboy. Um, a long sheet uh, was advanced from left common from artery and crossed over to the right. And then we used the snare, the 10 millimeter snare. And finally, we can grab the stand here. And we can grab it back into the catheter. And this is the stand. It was covered with some tissue. And, and I think it might be the endothelial from, from the vessel. This is the summary of this case. The procedure time was about six hours. Full time was about 130 minutes. And the contrast volume was quite a lot, uh, 350 ml. But however, her serum protein was quite okay, 1.05. So this is my last slide. Um, planning must be done before performing every single procedure. However, even a good plan, bad things might be happen and I would like to emphasize bad things. So be prepared, keep calm and call for help. And last but not least, I would like to thank you to Dr. Scott for the invaluable advice for this kit that saved me and also saved my patient. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Chai Siri. Uh, yes, uh, again, this case demonstrates common problem we encounter with an extreme elderly, which is calcification. And this is uh, a demonstration of one of the problems that you can encounter with uh, calcification, and especially calcification that comes in the bend uh, or extreme angulation. And that is you could lose the stent um, uh, with, you know, even with careful uh, manipulation. Um, Dr. Anik, do you um, have any comment about this case? Thank you for, especially for the uh, successfully correct the complication. And uh, in this case, uh, I think when you deal with the heavily calcified lesion and, and you have to uh, have a good uh, calm and uh, have a good planning. So uh, when you put the stand into the second frame, like this case and is uh, when you lost the stand. Uh, from this case, I think uh, the cut Y is uh, also lost. So so that is uh, is uh, really unreliable to use it. The, the rewiring and twist wire is uh, quite unreliable. Whether it can be grabbed the stand loss or not. So in this case, uh, in my experience, I think the because of the if you carefully look at the the image that you can find that the stand is really close to the guiding. So in, in my experience, maybe we can use the micro snare in this case. So if you can successfully uh, retrieve the micro snare, maybe the second complication will not, <laughs> will not uh, happen in this case. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Anne. Dr. Naratip, you have any additional comment on this case? Yeah, congratulations. Um, it is a very tough case. And I think, you know, all of us did the same thing. <laughs> I think, you know, losing the stand in circumflex like this is, is not very unusual. Uh, 
I think the way you treat it is, uh, is perfect. Um, but I would say prevention is better than cure. Um, you know, after losing stent like this, you know, I learned a lot. Um, first of all, if the patient had left main um, procedure from other hospital, first of all, I want to make sure if the stent is well expanded. So uh, I, I have to review the procedure nurse first if they did pot or not. So um, if the, the, the left main stent is not big enough, you know, I, I might do pot at the first time, you know, try to, to make room in left main before you're doing circumflex. Um, and I also, um, an imaging fan, you know, I would do either I was an OCT like you, but I'm not sure I would chase normal to normal in, in a case like this. Uh, when I look at the angiogram for the first time, I thought it was a focal lesion. So rather than, you know, putting two stents, I'm not sure if you do one stent from left main into circumflex would be enough for the elderly patient. Um, because when you do, uh, when, when you put one stent in circumflex and try to, to do the second stent, it, it can be very tough because you cannot push and you cannot pull back. You know, the stent is locked, uh, you know, between the left main stent and the, and the distal circumflex stent that you just deploy. So in a case like this, very, very um, extensive lesion preparation is the must. And, you know, I, I would try to push it carefully, very carefully. If I had any resistance, I would not hesitate to use guide extension. You know, I, I think, you know, if you do, uh, if you put like Geisela and, you know, track it with a balloon and put a, the, the guide extension, you know, in, in, a, in the distal circumflex, then it, it might be safer in that situation. Um, that I think that's my, that's my opinion, but the way you, you, you fix the situation is, is very perfect. And I congratulation again. Thank you. Okay, I think we, have, we, have, we have two valuable comment. One is about how to fix the, the problem when it happened. And the other one is, um, you know, when we're dealing with the potential uh, a tricky situation, then uh, a good preparation or careful evaluation uh, ahead of time. Um, is also as important as well. We still have a few minutes left. Any any other comments from any other uh, panelists regarding this case? Um, I have yes. some uh, oh, sorry. I have okay. some comment about the uh, twist wire technique. Uh, when you twist it, you will have to twist all the time and lock it with the uh, introducer very tightly. Even you using three wire but you have to twist all the time, even you come out until you got the stent out of the uh, catheter or out of the body of the patient. You have to twist all the time, otherwise it will come back and you will lose a stent. I agree. And, and usually we end up with three Ys. It's a, that's not uncommon. Dr. Azar, you have any uh, comment? Yes, uh, first congratulations with Dr. Saifli. Uh, I have learned a lot from your case. Um, my question is, what's the next strategy if the twist Y is failed for, for this case? And the second question is, what is the mechanism that uh, the second stain cannot pass uh, after the first stain can, can, can pass to the uh, distal circumflex? Okay, so thank you for, for the question. I think if, if I fail with a twisted Y technique with, with three Ys, I think I might, might be recross the Y again, but with an intention to, to cross the Y through the stand strap. I, I think if, if I fail with twisted Y technique, it might be, uh, it, it might be due to that the Y uh, pass, but not, not, not through the stand strap. And, and, and of course, I, I, will, I will try the micro snare. And for the second question about the, the, the cause that why I, I lost the stand, I think it might be uh, that Dr. Danatip com com comment before that. I think uh, we have two stand, the proximal one at the left main and the distal one at the mid circumference. And this stand was stuck between those two stands that, that's why I, I lost this, this stand. Thank right. you for the question. Okay. Um, so let's move to um, our third case, Dr. Uh, Anik. Can you uh, introduce our third uh, case presenters, please? 
Okay, Dr. Uh, the, third, the third case is uh, will be presented by Dr. Asa Pichabo from Silat Hospital. Uh, he will present in the title is Driving Over the Rock. Dr. Asa, please. First, I would like to thank uh, the TCTAP and CIAT for having me here today. My case title is Driving Over the Rock in a Patient 93 Years Old. I have no conflict of interest. And the entity years old Thai uh, female, uh, she presented to us with the dyspnea for three months. Her underlying disease was uh, were, uh, hypertension, dyslipidemia, uh, CKD stage three, and hypothyroidism, which is currently uterine state. Uh, she had uh, dyspnea on exertion for three months and also bilateral leg edema. She uh, I went to the emergency department and uh, required hospitalized admission due to heart failure. Uh, at that time, the uh, sodium was 118, uh, is hypervolemic hyponatremia, and her symptoms improved by diuresis. Uh, she refused angina, she refused any syncope. Uh, the physical examination uh, consistent with the heart failure and also the significant aortic stenosis. The shared X-ray was cardiomegaly and pulmonary congestion. DCG showed uh, first degree AV block, sinus rhythm, and poor arm progression uh, at anterior lead. This is the echocardiogram, good LV ejection fraction, uh, limit excursion of aortic valve opening with the aortic valve area 0.74, mean pressure gradient is 43, and uh, calcified at uh, non-cast and right-cast, trivial AR, and other valve is good. At that time, the SDS score of this patient is 8.09, which is intermediate risk. And uh, we send the patient for a TAVA evaluation uh, due to her extreme uh, elderly age. Uh, first rock we met is that uh, she has the contrast allergy during CT scan. The procedure went well, but she has an MP rash and also the angioedema, which is improved by the IV antihistamine, but no wheezing and no anaphylaxis. And this patient have to uh, uh, underwent the uh, further procedure. So we uh, pre-medication with uh, hydrocortisone every time. Uh, the CT evaluation show aortic valve, polymetry is 66, and the last is quite uh, small, 328, and the calcium score is uh, not, not that much, uh, 1,274. For the access side, the coronary height and ST junction is favorable anatomy for the Java and the core CT is triple vessel disease. Uh, so right now we have the patient, 93 years old with uh, severe AS, favorable for TAVA and uh, triple vessel disease. So uh, uh, we uh, present this case in the heart team and the heart team conclusion due to the intermediate risk and also the uh, patient extreme elderly. Uh, the TAVA was uh, chosen as first choice. Uh, then we do the PCI first, followed by uh, Tanfibral Tava, and uh, we do not forget to give her the pre-medication with hydrocortisone. Uh, we use the angiographic guided for puncture. The first PCI was done uh, at the circumflex, uh, just short the eluding stance, 2.5 by 15, uh, and the procedure went well due to her CKD stage. Uh, the LAD, we do the stage PCI next two weeks. The LAD lesion, you will appreciate that there is the uh, lesion along uh, proximal to mid LAD with heavy calcification. And also another uh, the problem of the diagonal osteum, uh, which is the aneurysm at, at, that, at that point. So uh, we decide to uh, do the rotablator. This is a uh, OCT after Rotor blader uh, and uh, you see the landing zone proximal and distal along the uh, plaque morphology is a uh, fried bus, uh, lipid, and also the calcium. And also the diagonal osteum is anulistum. So we try to uh, keep as simple as possible because th this patient is 93. After rotor bed, we uh, pre it and we uh, do one stent crossover provisional technique. This is a final angiogram of the LAD PCI, which is uh, acceptable. Uh, we use the diluting stents 3030 and uh, final is 3.5 percent. Uh, second lock we met is the hematoma. 
the procedure went well, but after the procedure, uh, she have hematoma uh, in 93 years old patient, maybe the, the tissue is not that healthy. It's uh, 10 by 15 centimeter after PCI and required a blood transfusion, one unit. And uh, the manual compression uh, was done uh, for uh, 30 minutes and the hematoma is, uh, is soft and better. And he, she was uh, discharged uh, two days after procedure. And uh, at the OPD visit at six day post PCI, uh, they are newly detected the right fibril fluid, which has not been uh, uh, there before. And uh, other cell doublers show the pseudo aneurysm at the fibril artery 3.7 centimeter. This is the groin, right groin of the patient. And uh, we consult our vascular surgeon for uh, help us with the thrombin glue injection under other cell guided. This is a thrombin. Uh, Glue 1,000 units inject into the lesion, and uh, the uh, the aneurysm resolved. The right guy was finally um, can accommodate the Tawa delivery sheet. Uh, the thumbing glue injection under other cell guide has the advantage over manual compression due to the higher success rate and uh, no painful to the patient. And also, if the aneurysm is uh, uh, above the inguinal ligament, this can also be done. Uh, and we choose uh, to do the Tava in this patient for weeks after uh, the, the sonorism was solved. Uh, we choose the uh, cell expandable valve due to there's not a lot of calcium and, uh, and anatomy is suitable. Uh, due to the perimetry, the size is 25 by tan femoral accessed by right going under the ultrasound guided. And uh, finally, uh, there's no palavra leakage and the ECT has no bundle branch bulb and we'll see it off the, um, the valve. And uh, what can you see more than the valve in here? What happened? You appreciate that the, uh, the, the location or the tip of the, the pacemaker is a little bit moving different from uh, the, the previous before I deploy the valve the tip of the pacemaker on the right uh, picture is moving up and down because uh, after we uh, deploy the valve and we pull the delivery sheet back, um, the, the pacemaker tip also uh, dislocate and we, and we reinsert it uh, uh, one more time. But uh, the procedure went well uh, without any uh, problem and also the uh, angiogram of the femoral artery uh, is no complication. This is post hour day one. Uh, after the pacemaker was removed, uh, we, we leave pacemaker overnight and remove the day uh, after the procedure. The blood pressure is uh, 70 over 40 at uh, 15 minutes after uh, remove the pacemaker. And at that time, uh, our fellow do the um, ultrasound and then they go. Uh, we can uh, demonstrate that the IVC is uh, petala and there will circumferential pericardial effusion and also the tamponade physiology uh, as you appreciate at the RV fever. And um, uh, the patient has the perforation from the pacemaker tip. Uh, in my opinion, I think the pacemaker tip is already at, at the RV there and after we pull back the the pacemaker, the tip, uh, that occlude the perforation side is, is open and the perforation uh, uh, have the, the, the pericardial effusion like this. So uh, the pericardiosis was done and uh, we got the bloody fluid uh, 150 uh, ml and hematocrit was 22. Uh, however, uh, the patient was discharged uh, uh, five days after Tava and uh, go back home and we uh, see the patient again at the OPD. Um, another problem, the fourth rock we met is the patient has right hemiparesis, the mother grade four at home and the uh, atrial fibrillation was uh, first detected at, at this time. Um, acute stroke uh, and the emergency CT brain was performed and uh, it showed a subcortical infarct. So at the time, uh, 
uh, we decide to give the anticoagulant for this patient. Uh, after long discussion and uh, due to the contact of PCI, we uh, we give the dual antiplatelet with the NOAC. So triple therapy for a short time. Uh, the fifth block we made is the GI bleeding, but uh, we have uh, it's fortunately that the GI bleeding is non-massive, uh, just uh, some uh, a little bit. And also that time the aspirin was discharged and patient was doing well uh, at nine months, follow up, everything went well. She has a, a little bit of uh, the chymosis at right arm with a minor trauma. Uh, the copidogrel was discharged and uh, we continue the NOAC. So uh, currently patient uh, is on uh, NOAC and she is doing well walking by herself with get it. And uh, every time we discuss with the family and uh, we do the communication and uh, they, they, they are okay with, with us in uh, every aspect. So uh, my take home message, uh, you will appreciate from this case uh, for the core procedure like the uh, PCI, the TAVA, everything went well without any uh, problem, but uh, for the elderly, there are more things to think about for like the environmental uh, problem, like the surrounding uh, thing that can be happen, like the contrast allergy, pseudonorism, stroke, and also the bleeding list. So I think uh, for the, this kind of patient need extra care more than usual. And second, the family communication. Uh, we keep update the, the, the uh, problem, what's going on and what's our plan to, to the family. And uh, her daughter, uh, uh, she can, uh, can take care of the patient very well and understand what was going on. And the third, uh, the heart team decision is very important in this uh, particular kind of patient that uh, need the compact decision, compact procedure. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Asa. Um, I think his final slide uh, sum, sums it all. Um, in, in extreme elderly, you commonly see one problem will keep happening after uh, one another. Even though you, know, you didn't do anything wrong, then unexpected complications still occur. Uh, Dr. Narati, do you have any comments about this case? Yeah, first of all, I want to say, thanks God, she's alive. <laughs> After five rocks <laughs> and, and she made it, <laughs> she's quite tough. Um, a lot of things to learn uh, from this case, but I, 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 I will comment on a couple of them. Um, the first one is um, the history of uh, contrast allergy. But um, I, I know I'm a, I'm a big OCT fan, but in the patient with history of um, contrast allergy and uh, renal dysfunction. Um, personally, I prefer, I was, you know, to guide PCI in a case like this, but, you know, it's just my uh, personal um, opinion. Um, secondly, um, regarding groin complication, um, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a radialist, and I would say, um, you know, even 93, we still uh, can try radio approach. And you know, radio approach will, will be beneficial in the most difficult cases like this. You know, in the elderly patient, um, a lot of bleeding risk, and even it, it, you know, even one point seventy five millimeter bur, you know, six French guide. Uh, some some six French guide catheters can accommodate one point seven millimeter bur, and I think you know, using six French from the radio approach is feasible. Uh, that's I want you to keep in mind. Um, and the last thing that I will make uh, a comment is um, the drugs. I think it is very important. Anti-thrombotic regimen in elderly patient is is unique. And I, I guess we might have um, Dr. Panipar comment on this later, you know, with her lecture. Um, but, you know, I, I think triple therapy more than one month in a 93 year old patient might be a little too risky. So in my mind, it depends on uh, your PCI result, you know, with OCT guidance PCI, if the result is um, near perfect, I think I would not give aspirin, aspirin beyond one month, you know, along with um, 
P2Y12 inhibitor and, and NOAC. Uh, I think, you know, uh, looking at your final angiogram, I think it was good enough to do just uh, NOAC and Clopidogrel one month after PCI. But congratulations again, tough one. Thank you, Dr. Narak. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Tenerak, do you have any comment on this case? Yes, congratulations with you. Uh, the winner today, the oldest one, 93 years old of the uh, three, three of uh, you. Uh, so I think uh, this is very common uh, in the uh, case that uh, really, really uh, more than 90 years old and you, you got all complications that we, we have seen in the textbook, we have read in the textbook. And uh, I think uh, from my comment, I just uh, wonder that even uh, you got a problem with the right uh, femoral artery, why did you choosing the, the same the same access, uh, even you don't have uh, furthermore uh, complication of the right uh, femoral artery, why did you not use the left femoral artery? Maybe because of the operator favor or whatever, but I think for me, if uh, that side have a problem, it's always have a, have a problem. So uh, I, I recommend to change the side of the access. And the second uh, comment about the bleeding and uh, stroke, I, I, I would recommend this uh, uh, to have the area occluder for this case because he got a uh, bleeding already and we still don't know what cause of the GI bleeding. And it should be happening again if you continue the anticoagulant in this case, uh, because you've come a really long way, you invest a lot in this case. So one more procedure, I think I recommend <laughs> the LA Okuda. And uh, or one more thing that I think this uh, patient will got in the next, <laughs> Uh, future soon, maybe pacemaker. Because of uh, the implantation depth is really quite, it's about more than five millimeter from uh, your, your, uh, your angiogram, uh, your uh, angiogram that I can see in the aorta. The, the valve is very deep actually. Luckily, don't don't have a heart block. Is there any special procedure that you do to put prevent the pacemaker in this case? Um, thank, thank you, Chantan uh, for uh, your first question. Uh, regarding the access site for Java, uh, at that time before uh, we puncture, we did the ultrasound guided and see the, uh, the healthy, the lumen of the right femoral, but due to the left femoral is quite uh, tortuous. So that's why we choose the right femoral. But uh, if the picture from the ultrasound is problem with the, the, the right femoral, we maybe uh, change to left femoral or, or other, other, other uh, way uh -huh, from that. And uh, for the LAA occluder, I think this patient, I, I, I also agree with you with the, with the LAA occluder for uh, the patient. I think if we can uh, prevent the uh, bleeding from uh, anticoagulant, uh, I think it's good. And for um, the, the bundle branch block, I follow this patient for one year. Uh, there is no left or right bundle branch block or uh, the PR. We are uh, prolonged, which is a little bit that there's no uh, anything changed from uh, before the procedure. So I think uh, even we uh, implant a, a little bit deep, but fortunately, uh, uh, <laughs> she, she is very um, endurance <laughs> and we, we have good patient. <laughs> yeah. And oh, for uh, the, the pacemaker, I think. Um, I think maybe from the tissue for the elderly, um, sometimes it's hard to predict the, the, the resolve. But af after this case, uh, when we do the pacemaker, time venous pacemaker, we try to look at it tip and do not force it. Try, 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 try to uh, put it um, in the proper place to prevent that. Okay. We have one minute. Can we have one short comment either from Dr. Purit or Dr. Panipa? Any, any comment? 
Okay, so congratulations in your case. So uh, the patient quite misfortunate, but he is very lucky to find your team. So congratulations. So I have two short comments. One is about the stroke. If we put the cerebral protective device before, such as Sentinel, maybe we can uh, prevent it. And the second, I don't know about the uh, cell expandable wall or balloon expandable wall. If, if we use balloon expandable wall, maybe we can just uh, pass over the suffering wire. So we don't use to use the temporary pacemaker wire. So because I, I found a case like you before that a lot of polycardial effusion after we put the temporary pace out. So I'm quite afraid of it. So I most of the time I pass over the suffering wire. So that, that uh, was my, my two comments. Congratulations again. Thank you. Actually, this case, the stroke happened at uh, two weeks after the procedure. Oh, so um, I'm, I'm not sure that the, the cerebral protection, but uh, uh, mm -hmm. I think the cerebral protection have, have room for, for, for them in the selected patient. Uh, thank you. All right. Okay. Well, thank, thank you very much. I think um, we should move on to our uh, lecture. Uh, we have Dr. Panipa Suwanason from Tsinghua University Hospital. Uh, the lecture is titled The Interplay of Bleeding Risk and the Treatment Strategies in Elderly ACS PCI Patients. Dr. Panipa, please. Thank you, Adanwasin, for your kind introduction. So my topic today is uh, the topic, as we said before, and as you can see that all three cases are the octogenarian. Everyone have a tough uh, angiogram lesion. So uh, we will see that today after the procedure, uh, how can we do to reduce the risk of bleeding in our patient and have nothing to disclose. So uh, first of all, I would like to show you that this one is the risk factor that why our elderly patient, they have a high risk factor for the thrombotic and bleeding event. So you see in the left side, so they have a thrombotic uh, factor that increase because of uh, increase of coagulation, uh, pellet activity that also increase the blood status, the endothelial dysfunction. And also because some family, they think that, okay, they're already getting also, if they want to eat something, so just let them eat, not sure whether how many years they can survive. So sometimes it just don't want to control the risk factor. But if you see in the right side, the right side is a bleeding event. It's also increased because of a myeloid vascular party. So that's also increased the vessel fragility. The patient would have um, um, vulnerable to have a bleeding and also they have other um, systemic comorbidity. And why we have to think about the risk of bleeding? Because if you uh, take a look at uh, this paper, it's from ADAPT DES. If the patient, so compare between post-discharge bleeding and post-discharge MI, so post-discharge bleeding would have a uh, effect to the all-cause mortality for five times, while for the post-discharge MI, just only 1.92. So the elderly patient is the one that we have to think about that. So if you um, take a look at the guideline, the guideline will say that we can use either precise death or the RHBR to uh, assess the risk of bleeding in this patient. And this is a data from our center. So as you can see that uh, even for the patient, uh, 75 year old is a minor criteria. I will not go into the detail of the HBR, but as you can see, that's only the patient aged more than 75 years old. They would have any one of, um, of the like GFR or their hemoglobin or the indication of OAC. So elderly patients is more, more or less like more than 50% would have a HBR criteria. And for the uh, criteria to use the RHBR and for the precise depth score, because we have both uh, systems to use for the patient. But the good thing about the RHBR is that it's not only to, uh, uh, to predict the risk of bleeding, but it also can predict the maze, uh, the, 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 major adverse cardiovascular outcome of the patient. Why uh, these two scores, both ARC and precise have, have a prediction um, that's the same, it's a 0 0.67. Um, so let's go to the precise depth. So precise depth have a hemoglobin age, a white blood cell, kidney incurrence, the prior bleeding of the patient, and we can calculate that. 
Um, there's also validation study in the uh, conduct in the Korean, uh, in the Asian population. So as you can see that the uh, precise depth score and RHBR score demonstrate a very uh, good discrimination for the breeding and also for the all-cause death. Um, the, uh, however, there's also some comment from the European uh, countries when they use the precise depth score. Um, this is the data from the elderly ADCS trial. So they suggest that maybe the precise depth score may be um, overestimation of the breeding risk of the patient. So um, that's still not really the, the validation study in the elderly patient. Uh, whether which one is the best score to use in the elderly one. And next, um, how we can do to uh, avoid uh, bleeding in the patient. So actually this is a process that we have to think about since before the procedure, during the procedure and after the procedure. So before the procedure, uh, everyone know that avoid routine pretreatment is the, this already like the global um, uh, recommendation. Um, but sometimes it's quite difficult for the patient to go to the cat lab within 24 hours. So uh, this is also have to um, talk to your colleague about the pre-treatment in the elderly patient. If you can do that within 24 hours, it would be better not to uh, do the routine pre-treatment and radio access that uh, everyone know about that. And the appropriate stent selection. Um, and the next one, and uh, is about the use of the iris imaging to do the stent optimization. And afterward is the choice of the ABT. So now when you take a look at the patient, the elderly patient that also in the high bidding risk patient, there's so many trials. Some study about the drug, some study with the device, with the strategy, and sometimes it's just fully not randomized, it's just single arm study. But as you can see, there's this is a list of all stents that already in your shelf in the cat lab. Um, almost maybe half of them already have indication for the shortening uh, duration of that in case that the patient's really in a high breathing risk. So, um, and this is a summarize of the trial of stent in the HBR that uh, we can use the one month the APT. Uh, however, I would like to emphasize that this is the trial for the stent, not for the strategy for the depth duration. So we would say only that if the patient is a high bidding risk and they have any potential to do the shortening of depth, maybe better to select the stent that has already been proved that can be used in the shortening um, uh, depth strategy. Okay, so now after we put the stent, uh, there's this uh, recommendation in the non STEMI patient. So in the high, so everyone know this default. The default is the high bidding risk will have a uh, and aspirin and clopidogrel and followed by aspirin and very high risk is aspirin, clopidogrel and followed by clopidogrel. So this um, flow chart is a little bit uh, look not because if you see this, oh, okay, very high breathing risk, continue with clopidogrel, but why high breathing risk continue with aspirin? There's still no answer for this question whether clopidogrel would be better than aspirin or not. Um, so, but when you see this default of that, um, that recommendation, they will see that, okay, and how about this patient? Because it's not only we, we assess for the high bidding risk for the patient, the high thrombotic risk is also important in the patient. So in this patient, she uh, this uh, 83 years old woman with the trifurcation already get the uh, three stand at the, the trifurcation. Um, so you have already, um, seen this table before in the guideline. So in this patient, she also got the risk enhancer with the DM, with the MI, with the multi-vessel CAD, with a technical aspect, as you can see here. The problem is that, okay, I got this high breathing risk, I got this high thrombotic risk, but why, how we talk to the relative or how we select the that duration strategy, because that's like have, three strategy to do. So first, um, I would like to introduce you to the ARC HBR trade-off model. So this is like um, the further study in the HBR study. Uh, they use the data from the pool cohort study in the HBR patient. It's a 6,000 
uh, patient, and then they see that which one is the variable for the MI or stent thrombosis or major bleeding. So as you can see here, that's, um, they put this variable into the score, into the trade-off model. And also they use this model to validate in the patient in the onyx one. So as you can see that the C statistic is quite impression is a 7.74, uh, which means that the discrimination of the bleeding is quite good in this patient. So if we take a look at this trade-off model and uh, we you can use the application. And then this will show you that this patient is a high risk for the MI and stent thrombosis. So the risk is like um, 20% and bar is just only 10%. So in this patient, that would be really um, not the case to use the short dab. One month is not possible for this patient. So it would be better to prefer to the three months. So we have to think about, okay, if we go to the three months, so what could be the best regimen? Um, so this is a that strategy in elderly with ACS because the risk of bleeding in elderly can be mitigated by the strategy. So this is a standard of care. Uh, as you can see, the bleeding reduction study, if we don't use the standard of care, we can use short DAP, one, three, six, and then aspirin, like in master depth trial. Actually, in master depth trial, you can choose either aspirin or um, or clopidogrel. Or second one, we use P2Y12 monotherapy after the brief DAPT, like in twilight. Uh, Intico is not uh, for the HBR patient, and also for the stop depth too. Uh, the part of the, the this trial have HBR patient, but not all. And the third one is P2Y12 inhibitor the escalation that not really study in the elderly as well. So first I want to uh, discuss first about the standard of care. So if we go to the popular age. So the study include the patient uh, non-STEMI more than 70 years old and randomized them to get corbidogel or ticagrelor or prasugel. But actually the, the, this arm, the ticagrelor or prasugel, the patient more than 90% uh, got tricagular. So in this uh, study, as you can see, the bleeding that increased um, in the tricagular or proscale arm, but the net benefit similar uh, is not inferiority. So actually in the elderly patients, better to consider uh, corpidogel because of the, the, the net clinical benefit is not different. Also, this is a study, not a randomized control trial, but this is study in the sweet heart study. Uh, the patient, um, elderly patient, more than uh, 15,000. So that's also the risk and benefit to use. Uh, if the patient is really in high risk of um, stent thrombosis, uh, like complex lesion, the tricagular is 20% reduce the risk of the MI and the reduced risk of stroke, but it's also increases of date and 48% of reduced risk of breathing. So actually, ticagular is cautioned in the patient aged more than 80 years old. And next um, is a master depth trial. This is a study in a master depth trial. Uh, I will not go into detail, but uh, the study from the master depth trial showed that actually the NACE and MAXA did not differ between abbreviated and non-abbreviated. Either the patient is indicated for OAC or without OAC. But the bleeding, so if you see this bleeding, uh, the bleeding is really, um, the, the, as you can see, the significant bleeding was shown that the blood was lower in the patient with abbreviated uh, who has no indication for OAC. But for the patient who has indication for OAC, abbreviation or non-abbreviation is not really matter for this patient. So this is actually is clear that there's no need for the patient uh, to have um, the prolonged use of that. Uh, just and another trial, this is another trial with the brief of a DAP and then followed by the P2Y12 model therapy after uh, brief DAP. But this study show the, the, the this is, is co quite contrast from previous study because in the stop DAP2 trial, the one month DAP uh, followed by the cropidogel monotherapy in ACS, the, the bleeding, yes, is decreased, but it increased the risk of myocardial infarction. So we have to, uh, 
to to wait for the data. So they will have a five year follow up. And this uh, this study have a fifty six percent of STEMI and eighty five percent with the radio and ninety seven percent of I So actually, this is also um, we have to think about in the ACS patient maybe the one month maybe too short for the patient. And this is the twilight study. This is another one with a brief DAPT and followed by the, 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 the ticagular alone. So as you can see that this patient, they have uh, the patient uh, about 17% met the RHBR criteria. And um, in this patient, the STEMI is excluded. So if you want to choose this strategy like twilight, it's not, it's, mm, I would say there is no data in the patient with STEMI. So this can be applied just only in the patient with non-STEMI. And as you can see that ticagular monotherapy after three months of death in the patient with high bleeding risk, they can reduce the risk of bleeding uh, with BAC 235, BAC 305, with non-significant of that MI stroke and uh, the cardiovascular MI or ischemic stroke. And um, so how about the patient with the indication for the oral anticoagulant? Um, so this is a meta-analysis that show that the anti-thrombotic regimen of the VKA, VKA plus DAP should be avoided and um, it's better to consider DOAC plus the P2Y12 inhibitor. And as you can see, again, with the guidelines say that the patient with ACS um, with the PCI and this also have like the dash line, right? This and the aspirin. Sometimes they say, okay, it should be one month or, but sometimes in, in, in some patient that be quite um, concerned about the stent thrombosis. How, so what is the tool that we can use to, con to consider like the, the HBR uh, trade off? So this is the data that just um, have a, this is a sub-analysis from the redo of PCI. So as you can see that there is, a, they developed the NOVA risk score to define that in which patient that tag uh, the triple anti-thrombotic is need. So the patient with the score more than five. So if we use this, the patient can be extended to like three months uh, without uh, with our problem of the bleeding, but this patient in, in, in trial of the renewal of PCI would be only 5%. So actually we recommend you to use the DAP, uh, sorry, for the dual uh, and anti-thrombotic therapy as a default in the patient with AA. And this is my last slide that the conclusion is that actually the elderly patient, they have both high thrombotic and high bleeding risk. So the risk assessment is important before we go to the procedure because we can tailor the medication and also tailor the, the duration of the APT and to the, the stent that already approved to use in the short depth. And the risk of bleeding in the elderly, as I say, already can be choose in the three ways. You can choose either short depth or use the brief of that and then follow that by the P2Y12 and uh, the, the dual antipilot therapy, it should be as a default of the patient with atrial fibrillation. So thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Dr. Panipa. Uh, for an excellent summary and a lot of data. Uh, any, anyone from the panelists or the case presenters have any question? I have one, one, one question. Um, in, in elderly ACS patient who underwent PCI, um, which P2 inhibitor do you prefer uh, and, and in which dose? Because some, some trials, uh, they seem to prefer protein P2 inhibitor, but, but, but some prefer copid, uh, grail. Thank you. Yeah, that's really a tough question because um, I will say that the, um, the data show like the, the data from the elderly ACS, they have the randomization of the patient with chlorpidogrel 75 milligram with a price of five milligrams. Unfortunately, the trial has been uh, disrupted before the end of the study because of the of the patient. 
Um, so um, they say that prosocial and corbitocal similar in terms of um, of the thrombotic, but of course it's is increased bleeding. But I will say that that is not the best one for the patient. Sometimes we have to consider that what is the troposic risk. So um, I would prefer to choose um, the potent P2Y12 first if the lesion is really complex. And then after one month, I, I would do the, the escalation to the lower of the P2Y12 like. Um, so I was, so in the non-STEMI patient, as I show you, the twilight HBR, um, if the patient category can, can be like fit to the twilight, I may use the, the, the T-calcular, but if the patient is not fit, um, actually prosocal 5 milligram is, is, is also fine to use in the first month because the, the, elderly, uh, start, the elderly ACS study have shown that the prosocal can reduce the risk of thrombosis in the first month, but later the bleeding uh, would increase. So maybe better to switch at one month if you really uh, want to reduce the risk. But I would say this is my own opinion. There is no data yet to, to show that if we switch that and what would happen in elderly with a high bleeding risk patient. But if all would be computer care, sorry. May I ask Dr. Panipa, um, would you use any risk score in your real world practice at all? Um, please recommend us because I, you know, I have, I have a question because, you know, in my practice, I, I do not routinely calculate the score. I use more like, you know, eyeball judgment because I feel like in my, in, in my real world practice, uh, it is not an RCT. Uh, we can see that in all three cases that we just presented um, you know, to the audience, they both have high ischemic risk and high bleeding risk. I'm not sure that they would fit into any randomized control trials. Would you do the score? Um, I don't do score. I don't, uh, actually, I don't calculate precise that score at all, but I do use RHBR because it's it's easy to remember. I don't say that we have to remember all the criteria, but some criteria is really, is easy to, to spot when you um, take a look at the chart before you do the procedure. It's like, okay, 85, and what is TFR? Because you have to ask your, your fellow or your colleague anyway, because we have to think that how much of the contrast that we will use. So, uh, so I will, I will I will remember there's only some criteria of uh, DFR and age and that's all and OAC. Um, uh, yes, HBI is what I use in some criteria. <laughs> Any other comments? I have one more question about uh, the uh, criteria for the elderly. We, we all have the study for the elderly with high breathing risk, but for the patient who octogenarian as our case, is more than elderly and is, has been excluded from uh, most of the study. So uh, are you still using the, the same criteria or the same uh, adjustments as the, uh, the elderly patient or do, do you have any special uh, special decision making about this kind of case, such as the duration of the antipalate, or uh, do you use just short lab in every case of the, of the, of the octogenarian? Uh, yes, so um, the, the first thing is the definition of elderly. <laughs> it's also different in, 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 in try. Sometimes it's 70, 75, 80, um, and that, that, that's the thing, the first thing. The second thing is that, um, yes, I agree that sometimes the patient in the trial, uh, it, like in the, in the subgroup of analysis, sometimes they just do not include the patient like AD. Um, but I think that the data in, in, in the, the, the randomized would guide us a little bit that this may be safe or not safe. Um, in my practice, so here in, in, in CMU, um, I would say that all, all high bleeding risk patients 
will receive Ticagilor <laughs> for one month. And later, we uh, discuss that how complex of the lesion is. So if the lesion is complex, maybe we extend to the treatment and later we de-escalate the, the, the antipilate to the corpidogel. gel. So this is the like adaptation of in each trial. To, so it's like a mixing of uh, many trials in the patient. All right, I think we uh, almost ran out of time. Dr. Anik, do you have any final last word, Jordan? For the uh, presentation of the presenter. So uh, my conclusion in this session will be uh, the first case we learned about the uh, ISR case in the very elderly patient and the treatment from Dr. Puri. And the second case is uh, how to deal with the uh, stand this lot from the elderly in, in the left main uh, circumflex case, uh, very heavily classified from the third chisely. And this, the third case is a uh, multiple problem we face with the octogenarian case from Dr. Asas and the lecture from Dr. Panipa about the uh, strategy of treatment and we have to consider in the SASPCI. So it, the my last co conclusion is uh, when we face with the uh, PCI with uh, in the octogenarian patient, we have to consider about the mental, multiple comorbidity like aging, high bleeding risk. We have to consider about the chart depth and, and uh, contrast induced uh, deformity and stroke problem. And for the patient, uh, vascular anatomy like uh, exercise uh, toxicity difficult core anatomy and uh, vessel uh, toxicity. And in the early, most of patients they come with uh, multivessel disease. And sometimes we have to fit with uh, ACS with uh, calcified vessels. Like the, uh, the second case, so we have to do the adjunctive treatment like the rotavator. And the last is uh, uh, we have to consider about the uh, interaction in this uh, octogenarian patient. That is my conclusion. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Anik. Um, I, I guess uh, let me sum up that uh, we have demonstrated all the, the classic um, issues that we commonly face with octogenarian um, intervention. Uh, they are high risk if we're not treating them. And they're still very high risk when we treat them. And so um, we just have to be very careful uh, well prepared um, and, 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 you know, gather everything we know uh, about intervention and, and pharmacotherapy uh, and, and use them properly in, in this uh, population. So uh, thank you TCTAP for having us this year again. And thank you all the um, um, speakers, case presenters and lecturers, panelists for an excellent and wonderful session today. Thank you very much. Uh, let's close this session now. Thank you.